Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebraic topology. In this uh, almost the last video on this playlist, I would like to wrap up a little bit and I would like to tell you a little bit about the applications of topology. In the last video, I'm also going to talk about applications of topology, but today I would, would like to focus on topology in mathematics. And in my last video, I will focus on topology outside of mathematics, which is pretty, both are pretty amazing uh, as we will see, or I hope you will like it at least. So of course it's a matter of taste whether you find it very amazing or not. Anyway, today applications of topology in mathematics, next time applications of topology kind of in the real world, whatever you want to call the real world. We'll see that in another video. Anyway, today I would like to discuss some really, really nice applications, and at least in my opinion, of course, everything here is a biased point of view, obviously, but I would like to discuss at least what I really like as applications of topology, algebraic topology in mathematics. Um, so I will stay with kind of the main examples from algebraic topology, and at the end, I will have a list of, uh, of very nice examples, which do not necessarily quite fit into algebraic topology. And I actually should say, like everything is as usual linked in the description, I stole this idea from a very nice mass overflow post, like uh, what are the applications of, topo of topology linked in the description, pretty beautiful answers. Check them out if you would like to know more. Anyway, so here comes a classic. So one of the theorems with the most known proofs anyway, some people collect proofs of this theorem because it has so many nice proofs. Anyway, and not, not, no proofs actually are really algebraic in nature. Also, it sounds like a statement in algebra. It's not really a statement in algebra. Anyway, um, it's a fundamental theorem of algebra. It sounds like a statement in algebra, right? Fundamental theorem of algebra. It's not really a statement in algebra. It's a statement basically in some kind of continuous algebra. So there's always some version of continuous arguments involved, whatever it is, in any proof. But anyway, it's a very important and pretty simple statement. It's, well, you have a polynomial, whatever, z to the n, blah, 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 and you don't want it to be completely trivial. Um, and you want to, well, want to prove that it has roots in C. So you have a polynomial with complex coefficients, and let's say it's, it's not constant, then it should have a roots, uh, it should factor in C, which is the same as you should find the root of this polynomial. And the way to prove this in topology is actually pretty nice. It works as follows. You use, would use the fundamental group. So proof via the fundamental group. So I would collect a little bit like proofs via, via fundamental group, proofs via homology. With it. So this one uses simply the fundamental group. So as soon as you know the fundamental group, you're good to go. And you can get going proving this. And this works as follows. It's kind of always the same type of argument. So assume that your polynomial has no root and you assume kind of that it's non-trivial, right? So it's, and n is not too, too, too stupid here, and n is uh, uh, the degree of the polynomial. So assume that it has no roots. And actually the polynomial, by appropriate uh, rescaling of the parameters, so I, here I indicate how that works. So the circle is given by this equation, r e to the i uh, theta. So theta is, uh, theta is, uh, is this guy here, uh, the, the uh, angle. And r is, of course, just the radius. This is r, and this is kind of the circle. And if you plot it in correctly into your polynomial, then you actually get kind of a, the polynomial gives you a rescaling of the circle, something like this, something like that goes around and around and around and around. And by the assumption that your polynomial doesn't have a root, actually this happens in C without zero. It's kind of the point. You assume that it doesn't have a root. So it defines your function p, I call it p, whatever. <laughs> so the function p here on the c without zero. And of course, we know what c without zero is. c without zero is our friend S1. And this is where topology comes into the game. So you, now you can look at the fundamental group of c without zero, which is, as I said, S1. And we know the fundamental group of this beast. And you can look at the induced element of p. And it turns out that it's really easy to see that it's actually <laughs> z to the n. And at the same time, it's 1 in this fundamental group. And then you're basically done because z to the n corresponds to n in this incarnation of the fundamental group, while one corresponds to zero. So you get the conclusion n has to be zero, but you assume that n is bigger than zero, which doesn't really make sense. So we have run into a contradiction. So um, the assumption that f does not have any roots must be wrong. So f has the nice roots. Okay. 
So this is not so bad. This is a proof that you can formally write down on about a quarter of a page if you want. So really with all details, assuming that you already know uh, what pi one is, of course. Kind of the only really ingredient is the usual ingredient that you see here, that pi one of the circle is something that we already know very well, namely the integers here. And then you are they're kind of good to go. Kind of a beautiful proof of the theorem, uh, which doesn't really use any form of algebra in some sense. It uses algebra actually, but kind of hidden, namely via the pi one construction. Anyway, so fundamental theorem of algebra checks very nicely using the fundamental theorem. So the next application I have in mind is a Jordan Brower separation theorem, which will check very nicely by using a little bit more fancy technology, but it's not so bad. You basically use uh, homology. The statement itself is far from obvious, also very easy to write down. So um, it's just a statement when you ever have an embedding of a sphere in the correct R to the N, then we get an interior and an exterior, okay? Interior and exterior. In its easiest formulation, like uh, this one here, so here's R, R2 in the background, and this is S1. <laughs> this is an embedding of S1. Here's another embedding of S1 that's a little bit easier maybe. Then you have an exterior, the green part, and the interior, the blue part. And it's this theorem is kind of saying this is always true, no matter how deformed your S1 looks like. So here's a very deformed example of S1. And if you just stare at it, it's not so clear why there should be an interior and an exterior. So I helped myself, so I can only see it if I would, I, I filled it with uh, some, so I filled the background with, uh, with red in this case. And then it's kind of obvious that there's an interior and an exterior, but by just looking at the curve itself, it's not so clear. And this is kind of the point why this is far from being obvious, although it looks very harmless because I'm basically saying I'm putting a circle in R, 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 R2 and it has an interior and an exterior. But the point is circles can get pretty crazy. As you can see here, circles can get pretty crazy. So this is not so easy to prove in the end, just, just because, well, we are just fooled because our brain just thinks circles are super easy, but actually embeddings of circles get pretty, pretty complicated. It's got tedious. It can get pretty complicated. Right here in this example, the only chance at least I have to see that there's an interior and an exterior was to fill the exterior in some uh, graphic program with red. And then it was kind of clear. And you should mind really that they're really, really crazy curves. So this was an open conjecture for quite a while, for quite a bit. And it kind of the only real proof I need, uh, I know, so kind of uh, not completely crazy, um, is the proof using Alexander duality, which I just wrote down here. Um, again, um, it's just one line. If you know what it is, I won't repeat it. But in the end, it's just one line that follows from algebraic topology. You basically check the usual nonsense again. The only thing you really use is that you, you know um, the cohomology or the homology or whatever of spheres. And that kind of implies the theorem. And this is in some sense very straightforward. So it's a one line proof if you have already established a certain amount of um, of uh, toolboxes, so of, of machinery to get going here. So um, otherwise, this proof is just really, really complicated. So I just warn you not to write it at home, right? We have a very, very simple sounding statement and kind of a general flavor in mathematics is that simple sounding statements might not have simple proofs. This is an example, you really need a big toolbox, but as soon as that is established, it is actually pretty straightforward from, uh, in this case, Alexander duality. It's kind of nice, right? As soon as you have the right tools, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, a little bit more fancy. So this, for example, you might wonder, I kind of get a little bit fancier in each step. So first step was uh, pi one, next step was homology, which is more complicated than pi one. And the next step is a cohomology ring, which is even more complicated than homology. Um, so we can actually use a cohomology ring to prove, again, kind of a statement in pure algebra uh, using topology, which is this uh, funny statement that the only division algebras, I, um, I will be more precise on, on the next slide, the only division algebras over R are kind of the known ones. There are only four of them. Um, you probably know R itself. Uh, you probably have seen C, which is so this dimension one over R, this dimension two over R. You might have seen uh, the Hamiltonians, the Hamiltonian numbers, which is dimension four over R. And there's another one, which is kind of the double of the Hamiltonians, which is dimension R, 8 over R, it's called the octonians. 
Um, anyway, so here's some picture of the octonians. They have kind of a funny multiplication. So uh, the multiplication works, for example, if you call this element k here and you call this element l, then just following this rule, this is k times l and so on. So this is kind of the, this Fano plane gives you the multiplication rule. Um, anyway, if you haven't seen that, it's not so important. Just remember kind of the only real uh, real algebras over R are R and C. Um, so H is not commutative and O is not even associative, but they, you could still, there are still division algebras, which means you can always solve an equation something like this. Uh, it's always solvable because you kind of want to divide by something in order to solve it. You want to divide by A um, to solve it, right? So a division algebra means you can solve those equations. And it turns out that these are the only ones. Uh, kind of the formal statement that will be a little bit more precise on the next slide is written here. So kind of the only real multiplication that you can write down on R to the N will happen in dimension one, two, four, and eight, which is very surprising. So why one, two, four, and eight? Why does it stop? One, two, four, eight, you would guess 16 is the next one. No, 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 16 doesn't work anymore. It's only one, two, four, and eight. And um, the proof uses really a really, really subtle refinement of uh, kind of a subtle structure you find in the co-monitoring, ring, which is the Hopf invariant, which I'm not going to explain. But anyway, um, so it, in the end, it gives you, it, it's an invariant of maps between spheres, and it only works, we'll see that on the next slide, uh, for certain M and N. And it, this gives you a purely topological, uh, topological proof of purely algebraic statement, which is again, um, really, really surprising. And this statement is not easy. So in the sense that, again, I only really know this proof or variations of it um, to prove this statement, which is kind of a little bit of, of a fun example. So let me be a little bit more precise here by what I mean um, with respect to this, the only algebras over R, 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 C, so the obvious candidates, plus the Hamiltonians, which depending on your background, you also might, might, might want to call obvious, and the Octonians, which again, depending on your background, you also might want to call obvious. So kind of those were already known for a long, long time. And kind of to rule out everything else was kind of the point of this proof. So there is nothing else. And here's kind of a zoo of statements and they kind of imply all one, one another. It's really nicely summarized in the paper by Adams that is linked in the description. So I actually stole this one. Uh, so this illustration by from Adams. So you will always read here some statements like n is two, four, or eight. And you might wonder, wait, 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 you just told me n is one, two, four, or eight. Um, so the case one is usually special and usually it's excluded. So in all the statements you read, it's usually two, four, eight. So, so you could treat one by hand. So uh, one dimensional algebras over R are not so hard to classify in the end. Um, so kind of ignore that case. And some of these statements are really algebraic in nature here. Uh, so R to the N is a normed algebra of the reals if and only if N is two, four or eight. Some of them are very topological in nature like, like this one. It's kind of a really nice interplay between those statements in topology and algebra. And what I said is not quite true. So beware, I have a little, uh, little kind of bummer here. Uh, so the, the precise statement needs a little bit of extra work. So strictly speaking, the only thing that follows in this topological fashion is uh, kind, of, kind of that you can rule out any other um, dimension for the multiplication, but you might end up with something that has no identity. Okay, and you need a little bit of extra work to kind of see that RC uh, H and O, uh, you need some little bit of extra reformulation to see that those are really the only examples. But anyway, let's ignore that kind of a very nice statement, which is roughly saying that the only good multiplications in R to the N can happen in dimension one, that's R, in dimension two, that's C, in dimension uh, four, that's the Hamiltonians, and in dimension eight, these are the Octonians, and then it's dead. It's kind of, kind of, intrinsically related to topological statements, which is extremely beautiful. Okay, so I should uh, uh, wrap up by mentioning some well, statements that I wasn't able to cover in this video. Um, so a lot of statements, very well-known ones, everything is linked in the description in case you want to, want to look at it, uh, follows by using uh, homology. For example, Brouwer's fixed point theorem, the Harry Bowles theorem, followed by using homology 
both statements, absolutely no reason why they should be connected to homology at all. And strictly speaking, kind of what the only thing you ever use is something like this. The homology of the sphere is what you think it is, the usual one. Um, and very similarly, there's the borsch ulam theorem and the Hemp-Sandwich theorem, which I haven't explained in any video so far. So the Hemp-Sandwich theorem is a theorem with a funny name, actually pretty nice, look at the description. Um, it basically says if you have a hemp sandwich, and in this kind of statement, the hemp sandwich is made of hemp, cheese, and bread. God knows why that makes a hemp sandwich. But anyway, in this theorem, that's a hemp sandwich. And no matter how you arrange your hemp sandwich, the theorem tells you that you can always cut it in a way that all the three ingredients are separated perfectly, so in, in, in halves. So you can always cut it, no matter how your ham, cheese, and bread are placed in R, in R3 in this case, you can always cut your ham sandwich perfectly. It's kind of a funny uh, statement. If you ignore that it also has a funny name, it's still a really good statement. Um, and it can be proven that there's no really reason to, a priori to be connected to homology, right? Kind of cutting something is, of course, just the cutting of certain polyhedra or whatever. Uh, in R to the N, or in general, uh, uh, in general R to the N, in this case, R3. Um, and there's no really reason why this should have any relation to H star, but it actually does, so it can be proven. Some other nice theorems are, for example, the Nielsen Schreier theorem. Um, it's just a statement about subgroups of uh, free groups, which can be used using, using covering theory. So, Hatcher has a very nice proof. And ag again, an algebraic proof is just. I don't, I don't even know whether there is any algebraic proof. Um, similarly, the cayley hamilton theorem certainly has an algebraic proof. So that was the one uh, about that the determinant of a matrix actually, if you plot in the, the matrix into the determinant of the matrix, then uh, you get an equation that actually works, so it is zero. And you can use proofs that are actually using basic topology, so Sarisky type topology, if you know what that means, to so really some basic topology. And one of my favorite ones is uh, uh, that there are infinitely many primes which you can prove using topology. Uh, link in the description. Uh, very, very, it's a kind of, it's of course a little bit too long for such a statement, but it's a purely topological proof uh, using basic ideas of topology. So open sets and so on. Pretty amazing. Link in the description. You, I, I really strongly encourage you to check that out. Anyway, this was way too much information for a video. So all I wanted to say is that topology is not just some fancy thing living in an ivory tower and there's no way that this is applicable anywhere. So actually it is very applicable uh, in this case in mathematics. And there are a lot of statements that actually follow from considerations of pi ones, H stars, and I even had a cohomology ring somewhere, which I personally like uh, kind of a lot. Uh, anyway, I also hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.